Hi, everybody. Baba Malik is really, really looking forward to seeing faces and moving bodies. It's rough in these conferences with talking to a camera. So if anyone can come off of their screens, come, come out, come out from wherever you are so that we can make this as interactive as possible. Baba can pick up on your energy. You can pick up on his. We can have an exchange of energy. So if you all do not mind, I ask that you all come on to camera. Come on to camera. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Hi. Hi, as many people as can if you are able to come on to camera so that Baba can exchange energy with you and we can make this an interactive and beautiful exchange of energy. Thank you, Queen B, the original Queen B. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So Thank you all, everyone. Thank you so much, Southwest Black Ranchers. Thank you so much. We're allowing people to come in. And we are going to do some introductions. So we're going to ask that you introduce yourself by name. If you're not using your name as your screen caption, if you can make your screen caption your name so that as Baba interacts with you, he can talk to you by name. And for our introduction, why don't we share our name and also what brings us into the conference today. And we can start with, uh, well, popcorn. So we can start with, is it Ayanfe? Ayanfe, yes. Hi. What up, though, Ayanfe? What brings you to the conference? Okay, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, let me. Um, is that better? Hi. Hey. Sorry, y'all. I've been out painting this morning at our new farmhouse at my job. Because I work at a farm, but I aspire to have my own farm or be part of a collective farm soon here in the future. Um, yeah, what brings me to the conference is um, I'm a groupie. I'm a groupie for Baba Malik. I'm a groupie for Leah. I'm a groupie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a groupie for BIPOC growing. So, yeah. And also here, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I'm new to this bio region for about four years now. I've been here um, in West Michigan, not, not near where everything is popping in Detroit, but um, Grand Rapids is trying to organize very recently around BIPOC growers. So we're trying to create a fund and some movement and some um, Bogart moves towards the city for some lots possibly. So yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a Grand Rapids Food Co-op Grow Up and Baba Malik is gonna be our keynote speaker in about what, two weeks, three weeks. Um, so yeah, I can't wait till he gets here so I can pick his brain in person. And uh, right. yeah, I'm just grateful to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Lexities, I think Plexities. It's Plaxidus. Plaxidus. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah, I was having problems with connecting, uh, and then I ended up just using my phone. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Plaxidus Titio, and I'm uh, from, I am in North Carolina. I'm from Zimbabwe. I've been in this country for over 20 years, and I've lived in four states. <laughs> And I've, um, you know, really got interested in, in, in this conference I attended last year. So I, I teach at uh, University of North Carolina in Greensboro, and my area of research is sustainable agriculture. 
And so I work with, um, I try to connect with, uh, you know, urban agriculture through uh, urban uh, uh, community gardens and farms and really excited about supporting initiatives that are taking place within our communities. So just on Thursday, I took a class to a sustainable art class that I teach. I took it to a farm where we have um, the, so it's called Congolina Farm and they are fusing, you know, the North American uh, agriculture with uh, Congolese agriculture and to see even with the crops that they were growing, uh, just some, great initiatives that are taking place. So I, I, I joined, you know, these forums also to learn and to try to figure out ways we can also support initiatives that are taking place within our community. So it's good to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here. Terry? Yes, hi, uh, Terry Jad. I am a professor of political science at uh, Butler University. And um, I've been looking at just a lot of different things happening in the agricultural arena and food justice post uh, Pickford, Garcia, Love, and Keep Siegel. And uh, I could also say that I'm also kind of fangirling everybody <laughs> and, <laughs> and just really here to learn. Um, and a colleague of mine told me about this conference. I was so excited. So I wish I could actually be there in presence with you. And I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana. So we have a lot of things happening around this community also. And we have a farm on our campus too. Nap town. Wow. <laughs> Not <She's> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> She's close. All right, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Stewart. Uh, my family and I started the Southwest Black Ranchers. We found out there were no Black ranches in the state of Arizona. Um, so, I mean, as you guys know, um, livestock is something that the Black farms have been pushed out of, like, tremendously. Um, so getting that going has been huge in the past year. Now we're actually selling goat and lamb. Um, building a network. And we've been um, linking up farms from California, New Mexico, Texas. So it's like the Southwest is really lost for the Black community over here. There's no organizations. There's nobody um, reaching out. And my husband is from Oakland. Um, we're from California. Um, but it's like we, we see the food crisis. We see all of this stuff. So we're growing. We're so happy to be here attending everybody like we, we've been networking we've been working with our city governments with uh, everything and I see we're not the only ones in the food desert so I just found that out about the dollar generals and the things because when we're applying for the grants and everything and that's what we have down here too so it's not just an isolated thing it's not just a black community thing it's a everywhere thing so it's like um just just organizing because we're working on a food hub we're working on um, these things because we're agricultural rich down here, but it doesn't get transferred to the people. So um, just, you know, this is this is beautiful just being here. So thank you guys so much. And I just want, hopefully we can find a mentor because that's why we had to do this because we couldn't find a mentor. That's why we had to build all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then our four kids are the Southwest Black Ranchers as well as what we're growing. And it's like finding that, that um, middle between the collective and the private because we're supporting a lot of new farms right now and that um, breaking that mentality and that consciousness of, of not being under somebody, you know, and, and, and being for yourself and creating that individual while you're building the individual while it's a collective, I think is, is our biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys so much. I'm so happy to be here. All right. I hope you find your mentor in this conference. Keidra? Gre <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. My name is Kedra Jiba. I use they, she pronouns. And what brought me to this conference is um, I'm an educator um, and I have recently uh, moved to acquire my mom's schools in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I'm interested in um, converting them into co-ops co and I'm working with co-op Cincy to do that. And there's a cohort of black entrepreneurs that's doing this. And I noticed that I was lo I'm looking for more blackness and more uh, challenge to capitalism. And so I thought this would, I will find more. And secondly, 
I am one of the schools is old, older children and I want to um, form a youth co-op and I'm interested in agricultural and culinary ed and the organizations that have been uh, excited about the project are also white and I want black. And so uh, that's what brought me here. I didn't know any of y'all. I just, I'm so like over the moon by what's happening. I have been to Gym City. I used to live over on Harvard. I was super excited. I've, been, I've traveled up there. I get stuff from, from the spot and um, I'm really, really inspired by the work. Um, so that's what brings me here. Thank you, Kedra. Brittany. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany. Uh, well now is Dr. Brittany Jones. <laughs> so I just graduated last uh, August and my actual focus in research is specifically black urban agrarianism. Um, I focused more on Toledo and Dayton area. So Kenya definitely knows a lot about that. Um, but I was definitely looking into land banks and how to have an equitable process when it comes to land ownership and of course, black food geographies and definitely just the whole action of collective agrarianism when it comes to elevating us as a people and um, just having our legacy left here and just to grow for the future as well. And that is really the main reason why I came to this conference. Um, of course, just to keep up to date, I definitely met Baba Malik a long, long time ago when I was doing my master's at Wayne State. And I love Leah in general as far as just her book and I've met her before as well. So I was just excited that this conversation and the center, um, centered message of just yeah. black agrarianism is very important. And that's really what attracted me here today. All right, Baba really wants to hear everyone. If we can just kind of like, Say your name and just tell how you check in. One word, check in, so that we can get through everybody and Baba can use as much time as possible. And then we'll circle back to some question and answers. Um, Marilyn. Hi, I'm local. I'm a, a, I know very many people at Agraria. Um, I'm a science educator, um, biology and, and um, environmental science. I've had school gardens. But I am going to run for township trustee. Okay. And I was very much interested in Malik talking about how, how important local policy. And I'm, I'm looking at the zoning code and I'm seeing it all locked down and looking at a, a long road to hoe. And um, yeah, that's what, so any, yeah. if you put me in the direction of people doing on the outsides of urban areas, the green areas that are now under control of industrial agriculture, how in the future we could unlock those areas point me in the right direction. I'm interested. All right, Kelly. All right, maybe Kelly walked away. Uh, Yensko. Perhaps walked away. Yolanda. Hi, uh, my name is Yolanda and I'll make it very quick. My mother is Cheryl Smith. She is a part of the planning uh, session. And if I did not attend, I would probably die. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> but I am also very excited about the information. It's wonderful to learn all the information. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Mona? Hi, I am Mona Jenkins, uh, co-founder of Queen Mother's Market Cooperative that is coming soon to Cincinnati along with urban farming and uh, um, some curriculum. So, Kedra, holla at your girl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy Roberts, um, I'm new to this whole world. I'm a filmmaker, and I understand how important uh, film is a tool to get, you know, our young youth back into farming and mm -hmm. agriculture and looking at things like that. So that's what I'm here for, to learn and collaborate and... Thank you. Thank you, Hondo. All right, Michael. Michael Brown representing upstate South Carolina. I'm a reformed politician, uh, longstanding attorney and um, urban agriculturalist. Just great to be here. And my first triple fat goose 
came from Dayton back in the day. I went to grad school at Ohio State. <laughs> Maritza. All right, Renee. Hello, um, can oh. everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maritza. I am currently um, a student at Ohio State. I'm studying mm -hmm. rural sociology and like Brittany, um, my research focus is also on Black agrarianism. But what I'm, since I'm in rural sociology, I'm looking at uh, rural uh, areas uh, more, and it's kind of difficult <laughs> because, I mean, we know that in the in the Midwest there are not a lot of um, Black farmers uh, in uh, rural places. So I don't know how that's gonna work out. I'm just hoping for the best. Uh, and I would love to see your uh, research, Brittany. I'm just here to learn and uh, network and get to know wonderful people because uh, even though there are lots of, um, yes, I am, Terry, yes, I am with uh, WFN as well. Yes, there are not a lot of, um black people visible there are black people but the visibility of black people in agricultural spaces is not very high so anytime i can uh, meet right, uh right. with uh black folks um who are interested in agriculture in some way shape or form i'm more than happy and i hope that there's a way for us to keep in touch i don't know if there's a facebook page or whatever where we could yeah. um, uh, uh, keep in touch um okay yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Baba. Baba Malik, you put together a presentation for this breakout session. You got all these wonderful people here. Okay, I don't know if we got everybody, but uh, if it's time to roll, I I'll do it. So peace and blessings, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, for those of you who I know or have met, it's a pleasure to, uh, to see you again. Uh, Sister Kedra, I think I just saw a Facebook uh, invite for you, from you, I think. And uh, I got to delete somebody, which I'm going to do later this evening so I can be your friend. Some people who I haven't been in touch with for a while, I'm, I'll, they'll get deleted and you'll be, we'll be connected. So it's a pleasure. I think I want to uh, jump right into it. I have a PowerPoint. What I want to do is give you more detail about the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and the work that we do. I'm going to try to rush through it so we can have time. And uh, Marcellus from Detroit. I see is joining us again. Um, so I want to try to run through it so we can have some time for, for Q&A. So let me first uh, share my screen. Bam. And uh, let me find this presentation. Boom. There it is. And I think we'll start at the beginning instead of in the middle. Okay. If you can see that, let me just see your thumbs up. Cool. Um, so the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network started in 2006. We are a nonprofit organization, not that we're, you know, wedded to the nonprofit model, but if you're operating in American society, you have to have some legal structure to do business. And we think that the nonprofit model is one of the least harmful. None of them, frankly, were designed to lead Black people to liberation, whether it's nonprofits, LLCs, sole proprietorships, or whatever. So uh, we think it's one of the least harmful ways of, of doing this work. And Kenya, there's somebody trying to get in the room also, if you can, if you can let them in. Um, so one of the things that makes our group different from many other groups doing this work in Detroit, and there are many groups doing urban agriculture work in Detroit, let me say that. In fact, Detroit, I think probably has more urban agriculture going on than any other place in the country for a few reasons. First, because we have about one third of the city, which is vacant land. Detroit is 139 square miles and approximately, approximately one third of that is vacant land that is not being used by human beings. So we have the opportunity to do urban agriculture on a scale which is unimaginable in most cities. The second reason, is because of um, the history of the great migration of black folks in the South and many folks who came to Detroit brought their agriculture uh, skills with them, including my grandfather. And I mentioned earlier in my keynote that I first was exposed to gardening, not at a conference, not on a webinar, but in my grandfather's backyard, 
who came from Georgia in the mid 1920s to work in the Ford Rouge plant. Um, the third reason is because Detroit's first black mayor, Coleman Young, instituted a program called the Farm A Lot program, where the city was assisting people with resources to do farming on lots beginning in the 1970s. And so there's more recent history that I won't go over now, but for all those reasons, there's a lot of urban agriculture going on in Detroit. The thing that separates our group from many of the other groups is our view that the most effective movements grow organically out of the people that they're designed to serve. Uh, we, we don't believe in groups that parachute in. We don't need uh, white missionaries to come in and save us or tell us what to do or any of that kind of nonsense. So all of the solutions for any community really rest inside of that community. We have the genius that we need. We have the creativity that we need. Mostly what we need is resources. And so we don't need other groups to come in and tell us what to, to do if they wanna bring resources and assist the tremendous uh, genius and leadership that already exists in black communities. We are supportive of that. Um, so these are some of our members and we're a membership organization and a more traditional nonprofit, meaning that we have staff, we have about 10 staff members, but we also, some of whom are seasonal, let me say that, the ones who work on the farm don't work during December, January, and February. Um, but we also have members, and currently we have about 80 members of the organization. And so we wanted to make sure that we maintain that grassroots perspective uh, so that we're always rooted in the community and we're not just some nonprofit agency that comes in. So we see ourselves as more aligned with organizations uh, that have been part of the Black Liberation Movement that may or, not, may or may not have been nonprofit organizations. These are so, just a few of our members. Uh, so what did we do? Well, one of the first things we did was wrote the city of Detroit's Food Policy Council, which we somehow got passed unanimously by the city council in 2008. And then from there, the food policy that we wrote called for the creation of the Detroit Food Policy Council, which we also stewarded in the creation and it came into existence in 2009. I had the honor of serving as the first chair of the Detroit Food Policy Council. And that organization now stands on its own two feet, has its own board, has its own office, its own funding sources. It doesn't operate under our organization. So it's kind of a gift that we gave to the people of the city of Detroit. Our largest and most labor intensive project to date is D-Town Farm and I'm sure for those who have heard of us, that's probably what you've heard about. Uh, we operate the largest farm in Detroit, which is a seven acre farm in a city owned park where we grow more than 35 different fruits, vegetables and herbs each year. I wanna big up the sister in the red on the um, left hand side of the screen, that's sister Jackie Hunt, who became an ancestor last year due to COVID. Uh, she was the first assistant manager of D-Town Farm. You can see she's standing in a field of collard greens and I, I don't know if this is true, but there's a rumor in Detroit that the collard greens from D-Town Farm are the sweetest ones in the city. So although I don't have empirical evidence, I'm trying to believe that. Uh, these are some other things that we grow. Kale, which is my very favorite vegetable. I didn't grow up eating kale. I didn't know anything about kale. I grew up like most black folks eating collards, mustards, and turnips. And then when I was a grown man, I went to an event and somebody had some kale. And I was like, whoa, what is this? And so it's now my favorite vegetable. We grow watermelons, cabbages, and all kinds of other stuff. And I'm not sure why my screen is not advancing. Um, okay, bam, there it is. These are some other things that we grow, more cabbages. The picture with the three folks holding uh, some veggies that's charred, corn. And really we haven't grown corn in about three years because we have tremendous problems with raccoons when we grow corn. And they're very, very smart. And they typically get about half of the harvest, no matter what we do, including putting up electric fences. And so uh, the tremendous losses we've taken on corn, I think have maybe demoralized us a bit. And so we've stopped growing corn the last few years. Green beans, all kinds of lettuces, cucumbers. Um, we keep bees both for uh, honey production and for pollination. Uh, this is my sister, Abba Ifeoma in the yellow. She was our very first beekeeper and uh, she's pretty brave. You can see she's handling uh, those hives with no gloves on. I am not a beekeeper for the record. I respect beekeepers and I love them, but I ain't one. 
Um, we do large scale composting and really our composting started with Will Allen, who uh, we worked with for several years. We served as a regional outreach training center for growing power. And Will Allen came and helped us set up our initial compost operation. This is when it was at its height when we were getting deliveries uh, frequently of thousands of pounds of food waste. And so in this picture, you can see all of those boxes contain either corn that was rotting, that can no longer be sold in grocery stores or collard greens. And so this was just one delivery. That was about 10,000 pounds of, of rotting produce that we were able to put into these long rows called wind rows that we use to produce compost. We've had to scale back our compost production because we're not having a flooding problem in that part of the farm. So we're trying to uh, find a, another way to do it so that, the, um, so that we don't create leaching into the groundwater from the compost that we're producing. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that we're having, which is related to climate change. And it's also related to two acres of trees that were cut down near us. And each one of those trees was like 50 years old would uptake hundreds of gallons of water. So now, now that water has to go somewhere and it goes to the low parts of our farm. We grow in four, uh, one, two, three, three. We grow in three hoop houses for season extension. We have a fourth hoop house that we use for storage. Uh, this is during the summer months. You can see we have beans on the left side and peppers on the right side. And during the summer, of course, we roll up the sides because it, it can become unbearably hot in the hoop house. And then during the, uh, the fall and spring months, we keep the sides down to re retain that heat. I'm going to assume that most people know what hoop houses are, so I won't go into detail about that. We do lots of agritourism. We give tours in non-pandemic times to hundreds of people each year all kinds of school groups from uh, elementary school students, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church groups, university students, so on and so forth. We have interpretive signs throughout the farm that can provide information to people. And this is the first sign that people see where we talk about ag Africans and agriculture. And we really stress that the reason that we were picked for enslavement was because of our uh, agricultural genius, that we already had experience with that and many of the enslavers had less experience with growing, particularly growing certain crops like rice, which I mentioned earlier. And so they targeted particular villages who had the skills they needed and enslaved those Africans. Uh, there's a lot more to that, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into de detail right now about that. Uh, many young people in Detroit are introduced to farming for the very first time at D-Town Farm. And this picture of young people helping to weed our collard greens reminds me of one of the reasons I do this work, just the sheer joy on their faces uh, is something that I find to be inspiring. Each year we do an annual harvest festival. Uh, last year we did it virtually, and this year we're considering doing it one day virtual, one day live, but this is a time when people can come out and celebrate urban agriculture who might not actually come to the farm and volunteer and put their hands in the soil, but they can come out and participate in learn shops, they can participate in uh, food demonstrations. We have live music. We have um, speakers and lots of other activities. Uh, our farm is totally off the grid. And a lot of times when people say off the grid, they're like popping their collar like, yeah, we cool, we off the grid. In this case, we just off the damn grid. There is no power lines coming to our farm. So the only electricity we have is from this solar energy station that we created. We bought a shipping container. We had 10 solar panels that had been donated to us. And um, a young brother in the community who um, studied solar energy and got a couple of degrees in mechanical engineering spearheaded this project and um, did the wiring for us, mounted the panels, uh, put the batteries in here. And so this is about enough electricity to power two houses or so. And this is our only source of electricity on the farm. Also in 2015, we contracted with a company, we, we co-designed and contracted with a company to install our rainwater retention pond. This pond holds about 50,000 gallons of rainwater. And the windmill that you see I actually operates a, an aerator in the water that creates bubbles that's designed to uh, not leave the water stagnant so it discourages mosquitoes from laying eggs. Unfortunately, there was a design flaw. We thought the one aerator would be sufficient but we really need about three because of the size of the pond to keep all of the water moving. So hopefully at some point in the future, 
we can supplement that one aerator with two more uh, because we do have a tremendous mosquito problem, particularly this year at D-Town Farm. You also see back there a solar panel and that solar panel is connected to a pump. And so we pump water from that uh, pond to two 2,400 gallon tanks that we store the water and then gravity feed it back down to water some of our crops. We sell our food primarily at farmer's markets, again, during non-pandemic times. And we sold at two markets uh, most recently over the last several years. There's been other markets that we tried out. Many weren't worth our time to tell you the truth because they didn't have the kind of traffic flow that would justify the amount of energy and labor that we have to put into staffing a farmer's market. Uh, so, but the two that we generally sell at didn't open last year or this year. And so we had to adjust and we created something called Shop Detroit Farms Online. We partnered with another farm, uh, Oakland Avenue Urban Farm to create this online platform that we sell our produce on. And then this year we opened up our farm stand again on Saturdays and Sundays right in front of our farm. So people can come either purchase our, uh, produce at the farm stand on the weekend or they can order online and come and get curbside uh, contactless pickup. Uh, these are uh, two sisters in our organization. Mama Janice Sievers is sitting at the table there. And for many years, she staffed our farmer's market at Wayne State University. And the other sister whose name is escaping me, forgive me, is holding uh, two bags of kale, both curly kale and dinosaur kale. Uh, in addition to the farm, we have a youth program because we understand that this movement has to be sustainable, not only in terms of the agricultural techniques that we use, but it has to be sustainable in terms of getting young people involved. We can't have all people whose beards are gray and who got a lot of gray hair in their head uh, doing all of the work of holding the movement. If the movement is going to be sustainable, we have to encourage young people to get involved in it. And so we are intentionally doing that through our youth program, which is called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program. And that program functions at two sites in Detroit. Um, the site on the left is a school called the, at that point it was called Timbuktu Academy of Science and Technology. It has since uh, changed its name to Barack Obama Leadership Academy. And you notice in this site, uh, the young sister is holding up garlic that they grew. And I'm kind of hating on the, on the children a little bit in this picture because the garlic they grew that year was much bigger and more robust than the garlic that the adults at D-Town Farm grew. So I know the object is to have the learner that, you know, out, outsmart the teacher or whatever. And so they did it, but I'm, I'm just letting you know, I'm hating on them just a little bit. The second picture is our second site, which is a site operated by the Pan-African Orthodox Church, uh, commonly known as the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And these are garlic scapes that uh, is on garlic that they grew. They also grew garlic and they were, uh, they cut and were weighing the scapes and they sold those scapes. And so uh, like, uh, like uh, our harvest festival, the Food Warriors Youth Development Program has gone virtual for the last year and we have uh, conducted it online. And then what we do is we actually send out supplies to the young people so that they can follow along, for example, we had a garlic planting exercise, and so we sent garlic cloves and topsoil and pots uh, to their homes so that they could follow along with the instructor online as she demonstrated what to do. This program is uh, run by Mama Hanifa Ajuman, who is the Education and Outreach Director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and one of the co-founders of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. We also, in uh, non-pandemic times, do a lecture series called What's for Dinner? And uh, this is uh, a flyer from 2016. My brother, Kashan Myers, who runs an organization called Habasha, based primarily in Atlanta. Uh, he's currently living in Ghana, West Africa, where he's heading the formation of the Kofi Ando Sustainability Institute. And we are very supportive of that effort and very supportive of efforts at link. Africans on the continent with Africans in other parts of the diaspora. And we, so we have a number of lectures that address a number of topics related to the food system. Uh, the big project that I actually spend most of my time working on now is called the Detroit Food Commons. And we partner with a, a developer called Develop Detroit 
in order to build uh, a 34,000 square foot building that we expect to begin construction on sometime between now and mid-November that will house the Detroit People's Food Co-op, a cooperative grocery store. And so we're following on the tails of Jim City Market. We're inspired by what we've seen here. And we are, we are looking forward to having a groundbreaking soon and in a year or so folks being able to come to Detroit and actually step into our market like I was able to step into Jim City Market yesterday. The market will have a cafe, uh, we'll have outdoor vending booths, four shared use kitchens will be on the second floor of the building, a 4,000 square foot community meeting space on the second floor, and also office space on the second floor of the building. This is an, uh, the architect's rendition of what the building will look like. We're building a brand new building from the ground up. It's a very expensive venture and a very detailed venture. And again, this is really what I spend most of my time working on right now. If you wanna get in touch with the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, uh, you can call us at 345-FOOD. Uh, you can email us at www.dbcfsn.org. We're also on Facebook. And more recently, we are on IG, uh, both uh, under D-Town Farm and under uh, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. So I think we have maybe about seven minutes left. I'm hoping that we can have some time for, for Q&A. Thank you, Baba. Thank you so much. Just finger snapping, finger snapping, finger snapping. Uh, let's see, do we have some questions in the chat? Um, questions. So, Somebody said that they were noticing how the two buildings look similar from Dayton and Detroit, probably because the learner has exceeded the teacher, though, because they call Dayton the little D. <laughs> Detroit is the big D, right? <laughs> no, it's interesting. Like, uh, I noticed that the buildings do have similar feels to them. And I don't know if there's any direct correlation besides the fact that it's all being done in movement. I, Bob, I don't think so. I think maybe we just like align, you know? Yeah. By yeah. the way, what up, though, Maria? Whitaker, My, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see. Love. Let's see. Questions, questions, questions. If y'all don't Try. have questions, I can talk some more. I'm good at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's see trying to uh -oh, we got could I speak one. more about the youth programs uh, Kedra said yes yeah, so yeah. the program meets at the school it operates at it meets after school uh, twice a week and so for that program you have to be a student at the school to enroll in the program and we maintain 18 raised bed gardens behind the school during the winter months, uh, we go into the classroom and supplement what the classroom teachers are doing. And what we try to do is find ways that agriculture and food system knowledge is tied into the state uh, curriculum objectives so that teachers feel like it's you know, aligned with what they're teaching anyway. And we do some teacher training with those teachers so that we can in inculcate this into the culture of the school. Uh, we also once a month at that school will have, we attend what's called family night and family night is a school wide event. But what we do is we come in and we actually prepare a dish that is made from the things that the children have grown in the garden. So, and we have recipe cards so that we're exposing parents to ways that they can prepare these foods that their children are growing. Um, the one at the Shrine of Black Madonna, we've actually partnered with something called the in Detroit Independent Freedom Schools which is um, something that draws its inspiration from the freedom schools operated by SNCC in the uh, 1960s and mid 1960s. And uh, the independent freedom schools meet at several places around Detroit. And so what we do is the freedom school meets first and then the food warriors meet right after, but it's the same group of children who experience both things. And similarly, we main, uh, maintain, we don't have 18 raised beds, but I think we have about 10 or 12 at the church site, the Shrine of the Black Madonna. And that program is open to any children in the city who are between the ages of seven and 12. They don't necessarily have to be affiliated with that church or anything like that. 
All right. Someone asks, is there an artistic component to your work, meaning like aspects of visual art infused into your food justice advocacy? Yes, 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 y'all. Uh, so we have multiple murals at D-Town Farm that local artists have done. And actually several of us in the organization, in addition to being farmers, are also either musicians, musicians singers, rappers, um, or visual artists. And so that's very much infused into all of the work that we do. And in fact, maybe I'll use this moment to, to do a shameless plug and say that I lead a band in Detroit called Molly Wop. And uh, I'll, put, I'll put in the chat our a web address and you can go if you want to hear some conscious music. So what I, what I do is by by day, I design food co-ops and I grow kale and by night I grow, I play loud feedback and guitar. <laughs> All right. Someone asked during our local food coalition meeting to talk about the development of the food community centers in the markets. They want to know if we can jump on the Zoom next month. Michael Brown, we'll both include our email address in the chat. So feel free to definitely send us an invite with a link. We'll definitely sure try to check our schedules and see if we can make it. Any suggestions on how a Black farmer can connect serve an area where there's limited connection um, beyond a similar experience. Um, they feel like they're called to continue serving and they're not sure how to do so in a new area. Baba, any recommendations? Yeah, that's tricky. And, you know, coming into a new area, you have to really, you know, find out what's going on, find out who's who, because you can spur a lot of resentment if you, if you don't do that. And, you know, you don't want people to feel like you're stepping on their toes and people can get territorial. So I would say, you know, the first thing to do is come in, kind of figure out what is the lay of the land, who's doing what, maybe how you can assist people who are already doing things. And then maybe over time, you can uh, determine where there might be some gaps that you can uniquely fill. Yes, move slow with a certain, your own agenda. Look at and the I'm, agendas that are already in the area. <laughs> I'm going to put my email in the chat again. And, you know, I if you want to, you can email me and we can have a more in-depth conversation about that. And I'm saying that to everybody on the call you know, this is like really quick, we're rushing through things, but, you know, I'd be glad to, on, you know, on a, a longer term basis, engage in dialogue with you and be of whatever assistance I might be able to offer. Yes, I'm having to go fast, guys. I'm trying to get as much as I can out of this little time. I'm putting my email in the chat as well. And do we see any more questions, Baba? No, but I see um, some comments from Michael Brown, and I, I thought I remembered you. Uh, your name and face look familiar, and probably at the Bugs Conference in Durham is where we where we connected. All right. My life. And I was going to say, like, I feel like we should just have spoken a little more, but I appreciate that. All right. All right. Well... Sorry to be so rushed, um, but you know we were trying to accomplish a couple of things, create space for everyone to introduce themselves and do this presentation. And it was just really hard to do all that in 45 minutes. But again, feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any assistance. And maybe the last thing I'll say, it's uh, incredibly important that you connect with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which is a national organization really trying to organize black folks throughout this country who are doing food and justice work and, um, you know, go to the website. I'm putting it in the chat again. Uh, check us out and link with us however you can, please. Thank you all for attending. And we will see you all. There is another session that will be starting soon. Peace. Peace out, fam. Love and hair grease. So I was going to like do the same PowerPoint I did for the session that just ended, but for the sake of kind of my own sanity and so I don't get bored, I think I'm going to show you a short video. Actually, it's about 20 minutes long of, about D-Town Farm. It's me giving a tour of the farm that we did earlier this year. But before I start the video, I'll give you, I'll put that within context and say that the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network began in... 2006. And in many ways, we grew out of some earlier work. I used to be the principal of an African-centered school. 
And at that school in 1999, we started doing really serious gardening with the children and developed a food security curriculum so that every class within the school had some, had to, was required, every teacher within the school was required to have at least one lesson per week that had a food security tie-in. And we were defining that in a very broad sense. So it could be a lesson that dealt with nutrition, could be a lesson that dealt with the cultural aspects of food, could deal with the economic aspects of food, it could deal with actual gardening, but we were trying to make thinking about food part of the whole school culture. And so after do doing that for several years, we had to create a larger container for the work because there were many people in the community who wanted to participate also. And so in 2006, we created the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. The second reason we created the organization was because at that time, there was quite a bit of urban agriculture happening in Detroit as there is now. And in fact, there's probably more urban agriculture happening in Detroit than any place around the country, primarily because of the availability of vacant land. About one third of Detroit's 139 square miles is vacant land. And so we have the opportunity to do agriculture on a scale that is unmanageable in most cities. I have a friend, for example, in New York City, uh, uh, Reverend Jackson, Reverends Jackson, a husband and wife team, they're both reverends, who run the bed -Stuy Farm. And the bed -Stuy Farm is basically where two brownstones were, were torn down. It would be almost unimaginable to think about having seven acres in the city dedicated to a farm, but that's what we have. We have a seven acre farm in the city of Detroit. So the, the blight in Detroit and the vacant land has really, you know, we've seen it as a plus in a way where we're able to use that land to do urban agriculture. So we have lots and lots of urban ag happening. But prior to our organization starting in 2006, most of that work was led by well-meaning whites who were running nonprofit organizations. And I, I wanna be clear, because sometimes people mistake this uh, you know, kind of vehement opposition I have to white supremacy to somehow I'm anti-white people, I'm not. I'm anti the system of white supremacy. And if white people align themselves with being against that, then we can be cool. But the white people who haven't made that leap and are still embracing a system which gives privilege and uh, unearned privilege to people who have white skin, then we probably not gonna get along that well. So I just wanna be clear, I'm vehemently and unapologetically against and trying to smash, destroy, and dismantle the system of white supremacy. I'm not against individual white people. And in fact, for the sake of the survival of humanity, I would invite you to join me in smashing, destroying, and dismantling the system of white supremacy and lifting up black, brown, and indigenous people throughout the world. Um, so prior to us starting the organization, most of the work being done in Detroit was being led by these well-meaning whites who ran nonprofit organizations. So the problem with that is Detroit is a majority black city and we feel strongly that black people need to lead ourselves. In fact, we feel strongly that every community should exhibit self-determination. They should determine what is in their own best interest, how they go about implementing those and others who want to assist can assist by following the leadership of those who actually live in that community. And that's uh, different from what we saw prior to our organization started, starting where we had a lot of folks coming in from outside of the community in an almost missionary-like fashion, supposing that they knew what was best for Detroit's African-American community. So uh, there's several things that we have done in the time, the 15 or six, 15 years, I think it is now that we've existed. Uh, the first is D-Town Farm, which I'll show you the video on in just a minute. But we also run a youth program called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program at two sites in the city of Detroit, where we teach young people between the ages of seven and 12, how to build and maintain raised bed gardens, how to harvest that food and prepare it in healthy ways. We teach them food justice concepts and everything that we do is from an African-centered perspective. We feel very strongly that both African-American young people and adults have to be rooted in our own historical and cultural continuum to move through the world in a way which is sane and functions in our own best interest. And so we make sure that we teach the young people about traditional African concepts related to agriculture, as well as the tremendous contributions that African-Americans have made to the development of the American food system and American food ways. We also do a lecture series each year called the What's for Dinner Lecture Series, because we understand that providing access to food is just one part of the work. 
but we also have to like raise the consciousness in the community so that people understand the importance of growing uh, food and the importance of supporting an independent food system that is separate from the kind of corporate food system that currently provides most of our work. Uh, peace and blessings, Julianne Walker. Uh, good to see you on the, on the call. Uh, and then the big thing that we're working on now is called the Detroit Food Commons. We are building a new 34,000 square foot building on the main street of Detroit. We expect to start construction sometime between mid-October and mid-November. Um, a two-story building, the first floor of which will be the Detroit People's Food Co-op, a cooperatively owned grocery store, very similar to Jim City Co-op in Dayton. And we are drawing great inspiration from the success of Jim City. Uh, I had a chance to visit yesterday and I'm just tremendously inspired. We're also inspired by the Flint, um, the North Flint market, which broke ground last week. And there are several other co-ops who are black led co-ops that are in the developmental stages throughout the country that we work very closely with. So with that, oh, and I also mentioned, I forgot to mention, we wrote the city of Detroit's food security policy and created the Detroit Food Policy Council, which now is its own entity. It's not under our organization. It was a gift that we gave to the people of the city of Detroit. So with that, I'd like to share my screen and show you this video, and then we'll have some time for uh, Q&A after you see the video. Put your thumbs up, please, if you can see my screen. Beautiful. Peace, my name is Malik Yakini. I'm executive director of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And we're here at D-Town Farm. I just wanna tell you a bit about the farm's history, what we do and why we do what we do. So the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is a nonprofit organization. It was founded in 2006. We were concerned about food insecurity in the city of Detroit. We were concerned, we are, were and are concerned about the fact that the retail outlets in the city of Detroit are not owned by black people, are not owned by the majority population. And we have an extractive economy functioning in our city, as is the case in most black communities. In 2006, uh, there were not many grocery stores in the city of Detroit, national chain grocery stores. And in fact, by 2007, a year after we started our organization, Farmer Jack, the last of those national retailers in Detroit, closed its Detroit stores. So by 2007, we had a city of somewhere between 800, probably 800, 900,000 people or so at that time with no major national grocery store. And of the 70 or so independently owned grocery stores in the city of Detroit, none were black owned. And so rather than just, you know, lament the fact that uh, we, we don't have good access to food, we wanted to be proactive. And one of the ways that we knew we could be proactive and take our own destiny in our hands is by growing our food. And so we started uh, growing at our first location in 2006 on the far east side of the city of Detroit. Unfortunately, a developer bought that land at the end of that season. We had to move in 2007. We were at a spot on the near west side of Detroit on Collingwood and Cascade owned by a church. Unfortunately, in March of 2008, I got a call from the church saying they had other plans for the property. And so at the beginning of the 2008 growing season, we were farmers without a place to farm. Fortunately, we had been negotiating with the city of Detroit for two years since 2006 for a piece of property owned by the city that we could farm on. And in 2008, we got a call to come out here to Rouge Park, which is where we're located now, and to look around inside of a 200 acre section of the park called the Myers Tree Nursery. We looked around in the entire 200 acre section and we decided that we liked the section that we're standing in right now. And so beginning in June of 2008, we started in two acres of this seven acre section that we now operate in, uh, but we only had two acres then and we started farming in this section right behind me, the section that we call the quadrants. And so we'll talk a bit about that more as we walk through the farm. But we've been here at this location since uh, 2008. Uh, we expanded in 2010 and added an additional two acres. And then we expanded again in 2011, added an additional three acres, giving us a total of seven, seven acres, making D-Town Farm the largest farm 
in the city of Detroit. I always want to be clear, the larger doesn't mean best. It just means that really we have the most work to do. So welcome to D-Town Farm. We're going to take a walk around and see what's going on here. We're standing in what we call quad one here at D-Town Farm. And this whole section on the south side of the farm, we call the quadrants. So we're standing in quad one now, and quad one extends all the way down to the middle of the farm. We'll walk down there just a minute and see where that, where that is. But we have quad one in three sections. We're standing in quad one section A, then just to the east of me is quad one section B, then section three. And opposite me, we have quad two, which is also divided into three sections, quad two, A, B, and C. And then on the far end of the farm, as we walk down there, we'll see quadrant three and quadrant four. So we have those names for the areas so that we can have a common language to talk about places on the farm. And so if we're talking on this in the staff, and if we say we're going to be weeding in quadrant 1A, then everyone knows that's the section that I'm standing in now. We also use that because we use crop rotation. We never plant crops in the same family within a three-year period in a, in a section. So for example, we have brassicas planted here now. We have uh, kale, curly leaf kale, and dinosaur kale behind me. So for the next three years, we won't plant another brassica in these rows because we don't want to deplete the soil. And so we have to keep maps of how we uh, plan our, do our crop planting, and then we rotate crops from year to year. That's another reason that we have to have names for the various sections on the farm. So here in Quad 1A, uh, we currently have three rows of brassicas. Uh, the first row is curly leaf kale. This middle row is dinosaur kale. And then we have collars behind that. And then just behind those, we have some tomatoes actually that we just put in this morning. Uh, over the brassicas, we have something called protect net. We had a really bad problem last year with insects, aphids and cabbage moths eating our uh, collards and our kale. And so this year to do a better job at protecting against the insects, we purchased this called protect net, which allows the sun to get in, which allows water to get in, but is an insect barrier. And so we should have less damage uh, as a result of insects this year. Also underneath the protect net, we have what's called weed barrier on the ground. It's kind of a plasticized material that we cut holes in about every 18 inches. We put our transplants in those holes, and then we don't have to spend much time weeding because the weed barrier uh, prevents the weeds from getting light and they're unable to grow. So it's really a technology that allows us to be more efficient and allows us to use more of our labor towards actual growing food here instead of using a lot of labor to, uh, to weed. Underneath the weed barrier, we have what's called drip irrigation tape. And so we use that drip irrigation tape throughout much of the farm to make sure that water is getting to the root system of the plant. In most cases, that's what we want. Most cases, we don't want the water going on the leaves. In some cases, that is desirable. But in most cases, we want it to go to the root system of the plant. So drip irrigation allows the water to go to the root system, but also because it drips very slowly over an extended period of time, it allows for deeper penetration of the soil. So we're going to walk to some other parts of the farm and see some of the other things that we do. We're inside quadrant 2A, and I want to show you a bit more about how the drip irrigation tape works. We actually have in this section radishes growing, um, and you probably know radishes grow very quickly, usually about 21 days or so. But we have this drip irrigation tape, which when it's not filled with water, it just looks like a flat black tape. But on the underside, it has very small holes and there's a hole about once, one hole every 12 inches or so. And so what this tape does, when we turn the water on, it slowly drips water into the soil over a period of several hours, and it allows it to soak deeply into the soil. So it's a much more efficient use of water. It doesn't require human beings to come out here and stand with the watering holes and the water things by hand. So wherever possible, we're trying to use drip tape throughout the farm is our main way of irrigating. We're standing in quadrant three here at D-Town Farm. This is on the east end of the farm. And this entire quadrant is planted with garlic, hardneck garlic. 
you plant garlic in this climate in October, and then usually it's ready to harvest either, either late June or early July. Uh, when we plant it, we mulch it really well with straw to make sure that the garlic bulbs don't freeze over the winter, but then the overwintering helped the garlic bulbs to be more pungent. And so around this time, the leaves start to turn brown. We're starting to see some, some indication of browning on some of the tips of the leaves. And then in another three, four weeks, five weeks or so, we'll see the leaves turn almost completely brown. And that's the signal that it's time to harvest the garlic. We'll pull up those bulbs and we already have a customer who wants to buy all of it. So garlic is a, a crop that's not really labor intensive because once you put it in the ground, there's not much more to do. Typically, you don't even have to water the garlic. The rainwater is sufficient usually for garlic. So it's a wonderful crop. Uh, animals don't really bother it much because they don't like the taste of it. And uh, it doesn't require much labor. And there's always more demand for garlic than uh, what we can supply. So this is our rainwater retention pond. We put this pond in in 2015, and when it's full, which it usually is in about March, it's all the way, all the way up to these rocks, actually, in March. When it's full, it holds about 50,000 gallons of rainwater. And so what we do is we capture the rainwater in the pond, and then we have a solar-powered pump adjacent to this pond that pumps water from the pond, powered by a solar panel, pumps it through the PVC pipe that you see along the fence, and it pumps it all the way up to the front of the farm to two 2,400-gallon storage tanks. We're standing here at the Dural Energy Station uh, at Detown Farm. And so what we did is we, had bought, we bought a shipping container. And we had struggled for a few years with the committee trying to figure out how to activate this solar <laughs> energy project. And finally, in 2015, Ali Dural stepped up and really took this project on and made it happen. And so we had 10 solar panels, which are on top of the shipping container that had been donated to us by Blair Evans. And Ali was able to work with DTE Energy to convince them to make the racks where the solar panels are mounted. There's a catwalk on top of this so we can get on top of it and service the panels. And they help with the installation of the lithium batteries inside of the container. And so currently, this is our only source of electricity at D-Town Farm. This generates about eight kilowatts of electricity, about enough to power two houses. Uh, we are currently using this basically for electric tools. And the, the challenge with this system is right now, all of the electricity is concentrated in this one spot. And so the second phase of this project is either to do underground trenching and run cabling underground or overhead wire so that we can distribute this electricity to other parts of the farm. So we are totally off the grid. And sometimes when people say off the grid, what they mean is, you know, yeah, we're really cool, we're off the grid. In this case, we just off the damn grid. There's no wires coming here from the local utility company. So this is the only electricity and uh, this is what we do. So solar power D-Town Farm. This is a mural that was done by Sister uh, Halima Casals several years ago. And uh, this is an important symbol here at D-Town Farm. This is the Sankofa symbol from the Akan people of Ghana, West Africa. And it's particularly important for African people in the United States because this symbol, Sankofa, represents going back to fetch your culture. And so we think it's really important that people of African descent reconnect with our ancestral culture so that we're looking at the world in a sane way and we can move forward in a sane way. This is also an example of us incorporating art into the farm here at D-Town Farm. So one of the ways that we've adjusted to the COVID pandemic is that we're giving away raised beds to uh, community members. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Prior to the pandemic, a lot of people would come to D-Town Farm and volunteer as a way of learning the basics of urban agriculture. And so we kind of serve as a training center also, in addition to being a production farm. But because of COVID last year, we couldn't allow, at least for the first part of the year, volunteers at the farm. And so they didn't have that opportunity to come out here and learn to grow side by side with us. And so we morphed that into a program where we're now encouraging people to do smaller gardens that they can do at their own homes with fewer people, with fewer risk. And so last year, we started partnering with Otibalan Village, and that partnership continues this year to jointly run 
what we call the Freedom Village Garden Initiative. And so we've gotten funding to give away to uh, 100 <coughs> Detroit families four by four raised beds. And that's what these are here. The raised beds are built at El Kibalan Village by youth in their, uh, in their youth program. They're delivered here to D-Town Farm. And then we're responsible for delivering them to the houses of the people who sign up for this program. We also deliver along with the raised bed, uh, what we call super soil, which is a mixture of compost and topsoil enough to fill the raised bed. And then we also provide a variety of seeds so that again, people can do uh, small scale gardening right there in their homes. Then in conjunction with this last year, we did a series of eight tutorial videos about beginning farming so that people can have the raised bed, the topsoil, the seeds, and also a, a wealth of information via these video tutorials about how to get started in gardening. So we're trying to kind of decentralize this so that people don't have to come to us. They can do it right there in their own backyards. This is one of our four hoop houses at D-Town Farm. Uh, these are known by various names. Some people call them hoop houses. Some people call them passive solar greenhouses. Some people call them high tunnels. But they work by basically capturing the radiant heat from the sun and making it between 10, 20, 30 degrees warmer inside than it is on the outside. So we use these primarily for season extension. In the beginning of the year, we can plant things here in March when we couldn't possibly plant outside yet. In Detroit, it's much too cold. We can plant certain things, let me be clear, in here in March. We can't plant tomatoes or peppers or what we call hot weather crops, but we can plant kale, collards, beets, uh, peas, spinach, and things like that to do well in colder temperatures. We also use this for season extension at the end of the growing season. So normally in Michigan, after about October, most of the plants are going into decline, but we can continue growing some things in here in November and December because of the additional heat. So this particular hoop house, we got as a result of a grant from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is an arm of the USDA, so we actually call this the USDA hoop house. And we have three other hoop houses on the property. This is the second largest. We have a, a very large hoop house, which is about 90 feet long, which we call the rolling thunder. It's actually on wheels and theoretically can be moved from place to place. During the summer, we use these hoop houses to grow hot weather crops like tomatoes and beans, things that like lots and lots of heat. But we have to be very careful and we roll up the sides during the summer because it can be unbearably hot in there both for plants and for human beings. We're sitting in the children's area on the north three acres at D-Town Farm. This is the last area that we acquired as we expanded into our seven acres. And so the north acres are three. We have three acres in the northern part of the farm. And we use this part of the farm primarily for public gatherings. So I'm sitting in what we call the children's area. And during normal times, during non-pandemic times, we have lots of children's activities, including what's called the bio blitz each year, where we have uh, students come from the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources. And we have community scientists that get together and they, they, we bring children from the community out here. They walk through the farm, identify all the <laughs> fauna, flora, and fungi at the farm. So it's a beautiful experience for children where they get to uh, explore the outdoors and then grad students from U of M get to actually work with some folks in the community. And then we get a list of all of the fauna, flora, and fungi here at D-Town Farm. So it's a win-win-win situation for all involved. Uh, so one of the features of the children's area is directly behind me, which is a clay oven uh, using a technique called cob, using mud and straw to build it. And our good brother, ancestor Kalindi Iyi, uh, built that oven here at the, at the farm. It's in need of some renovation now. We have to put another layer of clay on the outside of it this year. Uh, but we use that to bake pizzas, especially during our harvest festival and in August during what we call Children's Day. Another feature of the children's area is we have a small playscape over to my left, and we have a kind of a hollowed out log uh, that children can climb through in a balanced beam. And so we're trying to make the farm not only a production farm, but it's also a social place, a place that people can come to escape the microaggressions of the larger society, but also to commune with nature. So again, this is the children's area at D-Town Farm. <coughs> so
So we're in what we call the bee yard here at D-Town Farm. This is our apiary area. Uh, unfortunately, like a lot of beekeepers in Detroit this past winter, we lost our bees. Actually, <clears throat> let, me, let me correct that. We made it through the winter with our bees. A lot of beekeepers lost their bees during the winter. But actually, in the spring, after we made it through the winter, we lost the bees to mites. And so we had to replace all of our bees about six weeks ago. And so you might see some bees flying back and forth in front of me. Uh, these are new bees. This, this is a new nook, what's called a nook of bees that we got with the queen and, and her family that we install in this hive. And so beekeeping is really important at D-Town Farm, and we do it for two reasons. Uh, first, bees are tremendous pollinators. <coughs> so anything that grows with a flower like a bean or a squash or a tomato needs pollinators to take the pollen from one flower to the next so that those flowers are fertile and they produce fruit. But we also uh, raise bees because they produce honey. And so we just sold about 100 pounds of honey about uh, three weeks ago uh, from, from these, hives at, these hives at D Town Farm. We have a head beekeeper, Karanja Famadou, who works with about three or four other beekeepers here at D Town Farm to maintain the hives, make sure the bees are healthy. And when it's time to harvest the honey, he supervises the harvesting of the honey. So we always look forward to that harvest and being able to sell D Town Farm honey. Um, so this concludes our short tour of D-Town Farm. We didn't see the whole farm. There's many things that we do on these seven acres. We typically grow more than three dozen different crops. We didn't see all the crops that are planted, but we were just trying to give you an overview of the basic things that we do at the farm in terms of the, the, the quadrants of the row <coughs> cropping, the uh, drip irrigation, the uh, weed barrier, the insect barrier that we use, the retention pond, the solar energy station, the ex ex season extension using the hoop houses, uh, the children's area, and then finally the beekeeping. Again, there's more to the farm than this, but we wanted to give you this broad overview. So for more information on D-Town Farm, you can check out our website, which is www.dbcfsn.org. Again, that's www.dbcfsn.org. Thank you for joining us at D-Town Farm. Nice video, Baba. All right, so I think we got time. We got about nine minutes left, Kenya, I, I think, for Q&A or comments. All right, let's see if we have some questions or comments. We had a lot of people join us at the session. And let's see, well, I. I don't see any questions. I have a couple of questions. Number one, why I see you grew garlic and you said that garlic was really a great um, you know, commodity to sell. Is it true that wild garlic will make you go blind if you eat it? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I have wild garlic growing in my garden. I've eaten it and I can still halfway see. I can see as well as I could before I ate it. <laughs> all right all right and then one of our local gardens uh, we do have some questions coming up great one of our local gardens had an issue with overheating in their hoop house is there and so their tomatoes struggle is there i know that tomatoes need to be grown at like 80 some degrees is there anything that can be done when the hoop house is like 93 96 degrees what can you do to kind of cool that hoop house out uh, there's a few things you can do. So I mentioned on our hoop houses, we roll the sides up during the summer. That's the first thing you can do. You might have noticed that the first hoop house I was standing in front of, there were fans. Those are solar power fans. We have one on each end. That helps to circulate air and cool them down. And if neither of those do the trick, you can get shade cloth that you can put on the top of the hoop house, a dark cloth that will reduce the intensity of the sun on the crops. Great, 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 great. Thank you, Baba. What of your composting? Can you talk a little bit about your compost setup? Sure. Uh, I'll say, first of all, that Will Allen from Growing Power uh, helped us set up our compost operation. And um, we were doing very large scale composting. We've had to scale it back over the last couple of years because we've had a flooding problem now in that part of the farm. And there's some environmental concerns about things from the compost pile leaching into the groundwater. 
And so we've scaled back our composting operation until we can resolve that issue. Uh, ideally, you want to you want to do composting on a concrete slab, which is very expensive. So we're trying to work through that now, trying to identify some money so that we can ramp back up to the level of composting that we were doing. But at its height, we were getting maybe 10,000 pounds of food waste delivered each week that we would put in long rows called wind rows. And so wind row might be uh, 60, 70 feet long and six feet high. And we started out turning them frequently, but that was so labor intensive that we went to what we call a static pile where we only turn it periodically, maybe once every six weeks or so. Uh, and then we, we also would put uh, branches and things in the pile to create pockets of air because compost needs oxygen as well as uh, sunshine and water for the materials, the browns and the greens to break down properly. So really what you're doing in a compost pile is you're trying to create the ideal environment for microbial growth. And those microbes, those creepy crawlies, they get in and they eat what we call the browns and the greens. The browns are things that are high in carbon and the greens are things that are high in nitrogen. They eat those and they poop that stuff out and that that pooped out stuff becomes what we call humus, uh, which is not to be mistaken for hummus. Hummus, uh, Maria, hummus tastes pretty good, but humus, I don't think it tastes so good. Great, Baba. Thank you. Uh, Will Atwater has a question. Will, would you like to ans answer your ask your question? All right, maybe we'll walk away. Joe has a question. Yeah, I actually have two. Um, one, can you talk about how you guys started negotiations with the cities for the lake, uh, acres that you acquired um, for sure. deep ground? And then also, sure. I might have missed it, but um, where are you acquiring your bees from? Okay, uh, maybe I'll answer the first one first. I mean, the second one first and say, that for the last couple of years, we actually bought from a local, a Michigan beekeeper. We started out buying bees that were coming from the South, but we found that those bees weren't acclimated to our climate. And so we're trying to buy bees that are raised closer to where we actually are. Um, the first question, I'll say that one of the things that's helped our organization be successful to the extent, the extent that we've been successful is that we didn't just drop into the community and start doing farming. We had been, myself and other members of our organization who started the organization, had been activists for decades. I'm 65 years old. And so I've been an activist since I was like 13 in Detroit. And many other of our founding members had been activists for decades. And so we already had many relationships and we had the trust of many people in the city of Detroit. Detroit is also an activist town. And so we had two people that were on the city council who were already our comrades, who we had worked with prior to them being on the city council in different community initiatives. And that, that helped tremendously. And so having them on the council enabled us to steward through this application or this proposal for us using seven acres of city owned land. This had never been done before. And so we kind of broke new ground with that. But it still took, in spite of the city council support, and I'll name the city council members, the main supporter of our work was Sister Joanne Watson, who also, in addition to being on the city council, was uh, a national officer in INCOBRA, the National Coalition of uh, Blacks for Reparations in America, and had worked on many other community initiatives. She was the main one who helped to steward this through. The other one was my long-term brother, friend, and comrade Kwame Kenyatta, who's now an ancestor, who we were very, very close for years and had been in an organization called the Pan-African Congress together. He stepped down off of the city council. In fact, when the city was taken over by emergency management and moved to Jackson, Mississippi, where he joined the administration of our mutual comrade, Shokwe Lumumba, who had been elected mayor there. So those relationships with those city council members and with others in the city government and others in the community is what allowed us to have the kind of firepower we needed for the negotiation with the city. The initial agreement was a 10 year, what's called license agreement for use of the land. And we recently, our law, our lawyers and the city's lawyers 
recently crafted a new 20-year ag agreement. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Baba. We have a question from Will Atwater. Will, are you available? Yeah, can, yes, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I was yes. uh, muted before. I apologize. We can um, hear you. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, I know you started the seven acres uh, in 04. Can you talk about the conditions of the land before? I know you're in an urban setting. So did you have to, uh, what was the transition like? Did you have to excavate a lot of concrete and asphalt to prep for growing uh, <coughs> being in, you know, Detroit? No, we didn't because it was in this particular park and all the historical records indicate that there had never been any buildings on this land or any use of it. It was farmland in the 1800s. Some farmers deeded it to the city when they were creating this park and there had never been any structures on it or uses that would uh, lead us to suspect there were heavy metals in the soil. That's one of the reasons we were very interested in that piece of land. And so, I mean, we didn't just rely on suspecting it. We had, we've had the soil tested several times and it always comes back pristine. So we didn't have to do any kind of remediation. We did have to, when we first started, bring a tractor in. At that point, we didn't have a tractor. We have two tractors now, but we actually contracted with a farmer from Romulus, Michigan, maybe 20 miles from Detroit, who came and brought in a tractor and tilled the entire area. And remember, we started out with two acres, not with seven. So he uh, tilled this entire two acres for us and then we began to put in the walking paths and decide where the growing beds were going and what have you. But we didn't have to do soil remediation or remove pieces of concrete. All right, Baba, we are out of time and it's time for the keynote. There's a link in the chat for you all to click on in order to go to the keynote speaker address. Uh, Baba's gonna drop his email address in his uh, website, there you go. So reach out to him. He is readily available to respond to your request. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Peace. Put your peace.